Good evening, everyone. My name is Marie Griffith, and I'm the director of the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics here at Washington University in St. Louis. And I want to welcome all of you, those of you joining us on Zoom, as well as all of you that are here with us in person, to the center's first public event of the 2023 calendar year, a panel discussion on the subject, Why Institutions Matter religious perspectives on building and sustaining institutions in a fractured society. This is the culmination of a day-long conference with about a dozen of you who are here as participants, and I want to give a special welcome to all of you who have been here for the day. So I know there are many fresh ideas buzzing about this important subject. Before I introduce the organizer and moderator of this event, John Anazu, I want to announce the Center's next public event this semester, a conversation with the best-selling author and legal scholar, Michelle Alexander, moderated by Fanny Bialik. Other big events are also in the works, so if you're not on the center's email list, please sign up at the welcome table in the foyer to get updates on all of those. After the program, there will be a festive reception and a chance for you to meet our panelists. Tonight's event is the latest in the center's long and deep engagement with contemporary problems relating to religion and politics in American religion and society, as well as our attempt to offer insights about ways that ordinary people and institutions can address these problems and contribute to their broader solutions. It's no secret that we are living in a time of extreme political polarization and social mistrust. Our events at the Center on Religion and Politics have addressed this reality from many angles in the past, in hopes of shedding new light on ways we might all make our way through the moment that we're in and promote a more just and peaceful society. We want to understand how we got to the particular place where we stand today. And we also want to encourage practical action for responding to current conditions and improving our social institutions, our political norms, and our relationships with others, both those with whom we tend to agree on big moral issues, and even more importantly, those with whom we disagree. We are extremely fortunate to have four distinguished guests with us tonight who have thought deeply about these issues. I'm very grateful to tonight's organizer and moderator for his own contributions to these conversations, both in the past and in the present, and I will now introduce and turn things over to him for the remainder of the evening. John Anazu is the Sally D. Danforth Distinguished Professor of Law and Religion, a dual appointment in the Washington University School of Law and the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. He also holds a courtesy appointment as Professor of Political Science, and he is the Executive Director of the Carver Project, a nonprofit organization for Christian faculty and students. His scholarships his scholarship focuses on the First Amendment of freedoms of speech, assembly, and religion, and related questions of legal and political theory. Professor Anazu's books include Liberty's Refuge, The Forgotten Freedom of Assembly, which seeks to recover the role of assembly in American political and constitutional thought, and Confident Pluralism, Surviving and Thriving Through Deep Difference which focuses on ways to move through our current divided politics. Professor Anazu is the special editor of a volume on law and theology published in Law and Contemporary Problems, and also co-editor with Tim Keller of Uncommon Ground, Living Faithfully in a World of Difference. His articles have appeared in a number of law reviews and specialty journals, and he has also written widely for mainstream audiences in a number of venues, including The Atlantic, USA Today, The Los Angeles Times, and The Washington Post. He earned his PhD at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and his JD and BSE from Duke University. Prior to joining our law faculty, he was a visiting assistant professor at Duke School of Law and a Royster Fellow at the University of North Carolina. He clerked for Judge Roger L. Woolman of the US Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit and served for four years as an Associate General Counsel with the Department of the Air Force at the Pentagon. And there is much more to say here, but I don't want to take away from tonight's event. So please join me in welcoming John Anazu.
Good evening. It's so great to see all of you. Thanks for coming out and also to everyone joining online, including a special greeting to Senator Danforth watching from California tonight. Uh, as Marie mentioned, uh, tonight's discussion and panel follows a day-long conference, and I want to thank especially Deborah Kennard and Molly Harris from the Danforth Center, and also my research assistants, Katie Schmidt and Elijah Weissman, for helping to pull off this conference. And I'm uh, delighted to continue the discussion. We've had a lively discussion all day tonight with our four distinguished panelists. I'm going to introduce them collectively and then have uh, invite them all up to the stage for some questions. And uh, we'll have time at the end for questions from you. So be, be thinking of very hard and complicated questions to ask them. Uh, our panelists tonight, let me start with Rick Garnett, who's the Paul J. Sherrill Fort Howard Corporation Professor of Law at Notre Dame Law School, where he also directs the program on church, state, and society. Professor Garnett clerked for Judge Richard Arnold on the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit and Chief Justice William Rehnquist on the United States Supreme Court. Kristen Dede Johnson is the GW and Edna Hayworth Professor of Educational Ministries and Leadership at Western Theological Seminary, where she is also Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs. She's the author of the award-winning book, The Justice Calling, Where Passion Meets Perseverance from Brazos Press. Shadi Hamid is a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings Institution. We learned it's institution, not institute. And an assistant research professor of Islamic studies at Fuller Theological Seminary. His latest book is The Problem of Democracy, America, the Middle East, and the Rise and Fall of an Idea, published by Oxford University Press. And finally, Yaval Levine is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He's the founder and editor of National Affairs and senior editor at the New Atlantis, a contributing editor to the National Review, and a contributing opinion writer to the New York Times. His most recent book is A Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream, Public published by Basic Books. Please join me in welcoming our four panelists to the stage. Well, it's great to have you here, and I'm, I'm so glad that you all are going to answer all the substance now. So let, <laughs> let me start, though, uh, with a, a question that has proven to be harder than we thought, which is, what is an institution? Can you maybe offer some definitions? And it would be helpful to provide some examples of what institutions are. Let me go ahead and start with Shadi at the end. Oh, wow. OK. <laughs> that, um, I was going to say Yuval. He wrote the book on this. But OK. Um, so you know, institutions, I can maybe say a little bit about what I think institutions are about. I mean, there are obviously different scholarly definitions that get into the specifics. But I think for, for a general audience, it's good to get, like, what is the purpose? I think at a very basic level, institutions are about channeling and coordinating collective action. They are about transcending the individual who acts alone. The, uh, institutions give us a foundation in that sense. And institutions must be built. So there's a process that kind of colors the enterprise. And, um, and institutions offer a certain kind of order and predictability. They help with passing on knowledge and in that sense, they can preserve a tradition. Um, so most institutions have a tradition of some sort. And that's why we use phrases like institutional knowledge, institutional memory. And there's a reason that those are just common things that we use, um, at least some people use them. Um, and maybe just the last thing I'd emphasize, because I think this is really important, is that institutions, um, they reduce our choices. Because once you're embedded in an institution, you don't have unlimited choice. And I tend to think this is a good thing. As we have talked about over the course of today, I mean, uh, choice, you know, uh, I think you've all, you put it this way, choice is overrated. Um, but we also know there's something called the paradox of choice that the more choices we have, the more unhappy we become. Some of you might be familiar with the experiment in behavioral economics where they give people <clears throat> jars of jam and then tell them to choose one. So they give one group three jars of jam and then ask them to choose their, the one they want to stick with. The other group gets 28 jars of jam. And you probably know where this story is going. The ones who have all this choice, the 28 different jars, 
they are just perpetually unhappy no matter what they choose because they're wondering about the other 27 options. Like, did I miss out? And this is you know, also an issue with online dating for those of you on <laughs> Tinder. Um, so in that sense, institutions make our lives easier and better because they introduce constraints on our individual action. Christine. So yes, institutions are kind of notoriously difficult to define. And one of the challenges is that a lot of different disciplines tend to weigh in, but they tend to weigh in separately. So you have political theorists wondering about it, and sociologists wondering about it, and economists wondering about it. And there's not always overlap between their definitions. I tend to come at it more sociologically um, connecting it to culture, and culture is another term that has a wide array of meanings. Um, so culture, as I understand it, uh, refers in the deepest sense to a system of meaning and moral order into which uh, people um, are born or into which they're grafted, often without even realizing it, and it provides order and meaning and structure. And institutions then play a really important role as part of that meaning, making, and ordering. Um, and they're often invisible, um, as one anthropologist puts it. They veil their influence. So we can live our lives without really an awareness of institutions, even though they are largely mediated by institutions. So I was mentioning to the group earlier today, I sometimes will do a little thought experiment. Think about maybe three to five people that you're closest to in your life. And then think about how you know them. And I have yet to find someone for whom they're, that each person isn't connected to an institution, a family member, a business, a community, a school. Um, so we tend, at least in, in, in US context, to think individualistically, but our lives are often framed institutionally. Um, and then I just gave a couple examples, family, education, commerce. We can unpack more of those as we go along. Mm. Well, I, first of all, let me just uh, thank you, John, for organizing this extraordinary day of conversations uh, and the Danforth Center for hosting us. Um, I very much agree with what's been said. I mean, maybe all I can add really is that I, I, th th there are a lot of ways of defining institutions. Um, the great political scientist Hugh Hecklow wrote a book about this uh, almost 20 years ago now, trying to go through the academic literature and, and find definitions. And he's, he found so many, he had to stop and say, <laughs> OK, let's think about categories of definition. But I would say that for, for the purposes of thinking about the ways in which they interact with the challenges our society faces at the moment, one useful way to think about institutions is that institutions are the durable forms of our common life. They're the shapes, the structures of what it is that we do together. So that an institution is not just a bunch of people, it's a bunch of people organized around a common purpose in a way that gives each of them a role relative to the others and to the purpose. Um, and so some institutions are organizations, a company, a school, a uh, civic association, but some institutions are less formally organized than that. They're not technically organizations, but they're clearly forms of, of common action. A family, as we've said, is, is a, one of the basic institutions of any society. You might think of the rule of law as an institution. Uh, we can talk about a tradition as an institution. And what's, one thing that's important about them is that they're durable. Institutions occupy a social space over time. Uh, and so they, they shape that space uh, over an extended period. A flash mob is not an institution. <laughs> but what's most important about them is that they are a form. They, they structure the way in which we work together to achieve something together. And in the process of doing that, they structure us. They structure the people in them and give us a form so that there is such a thing in the world, you know, as a doctor. You can talk to somebody for a little while and they say, I'm a dentist. And you say, that doesn't surprise me in the least. I, I figured you were a dentist. <laughs> and the, the reason is there's such a thing in the world as a dentist. And we know what that looks like. We know what that person does and doesn't do. And I would add one other thing that we talk a lot now about trust in institutions. And I think trust in institutions has a lot to do with that way in which they form us particularly, as Shadi suggests, in the ways in which they constrain us. We trust an institution when it seems to form people who pursue its purpose with some integrity. And we know that there are things those people wouldn't do, right? You trust an accountant, not just because she might know the tax laws better than you do, hopefully that's the case, but also because there are things an accountant would never do. And a person who did do those things isn't really an accountant. 
and trust in them, trust in a doctor, trust in a priest, trust in a journalist, is a function of the, of the sense we have that they do their work in accordance with some kind of process that constrains them for our benefit, that is for the benefit of the good that the institution serves. And a lot of our institutions do that for us and enable us to trust people in the world. Without them, it is very, very hard to trust people with power. I think that's all wonderful. I, I can't improve on it. Um, let me give you, uh, let me just give you a, a picture that helps to capture how I, I think of what institutions uh, do for us. Um, and it's not original to me. I, I stole it from uh, Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, imagine someplace really bleak and flat like North Dakota or Illinois or something. Um, <laughs> and the wind comes howling across it. The wind comes howling across it. Um, institutions are like windbreaks. Uh, they're, they're trees on the prairie. Um, and the, the way I get this from the play is um, Thomas More's son-in-law is really up in arms about some what he perceives as uh, injustice and says that he would cut down every law on the land to get after the devil. And following on uh, Yuval's point, rem remembering that the rule of law is an institution, Thomas More is reported to say back, well, where would you stand when the devil turned and came back at you and there was nothing standing between you and him since you cut down all the laws in England? Institutions are like that. Individuals by themselves were vulnerable to a lot of forces. A world that was inhabited, a social space that was inhabited only by people by themselves and the political authority, the state or the huge corporation or what have you, that's a risky world. Institutions help buffer that space, whether it's our families, um, uh, our little league clubs, our workplaces, our, our, our universities, institutions kind of thicken up the landscape of civil society. And by doing that, they protect us. Just one comment on this notion of constraint. It, it strikes me that a, a healthy institution constrains insofar as it allows its members to identify and pursue mission, vision, values an unhealthy institution that lacks those constraints doesn't always know what its purpose is and doesn't always know what it's doing, which then allows yeah. bad actors from within the institution to direct it in different ways. So constraint, I, I, I love that piece of it, but it, it's not present in all institutions. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, uh, you're all here as subject matter experts, but you also represent four particular faith traditions. And as you think about your own faith backgrounds, are there theological resources within your traditions that help you understand institutions? And then, so I'm not playing hide the ball here, how also do you think about the reality of so much corruption and abuse of power within religious institutions? And, and is there a theological account for that state of, of religious institutions? Anyone wanna jump in there? <laughs> Well, I'm a uh, Roman Catholic, so I'm familiar with failed institutions. <laughs> um, but uh, I also believe that my institution is the, the body of Christ, so uh, I'm happy about that. Um, the theological reason why institutions can go, can go wrong, it seems to me, is similar to the reason why all of us can go wrong, is that we're, we're fallen and flawed, uh, but redeemed. And um, so we shouldn't be surprised that even the best human institutions are gonna partake of some of the ways in which we can fall short too. So I, I, I guess I don't find myself, um, you know, really troubled by the fact, although I wish it would happen less often, that our religious and our faith-based institutions um, uh, could let us down. And I think it's a challenge obviously for all of us to try to do what we can to hold them to account and build them up. Um, you know, in, in terms of, uh, uh, a theological reason for thinking about institutions the way I do. Um, I guess I, whether I get this from my faith tradition or just from you know undergraduate readings of Aristotle or what have you, I really, it, it seems so true to me that human beings are social, that we're made for connections, that we're not, it's, it's not good for the human person to be alone. And institutions are a way of kind of concretizing that togetherness that I think human beings need to be fully human to be what God made us to be. So I, I, I'm, I'm Jewish and we uh, certainly, in, in a certain way, the, the, the early story of Judaism is very much built around a set of institutions and especially the institution of the temple. And then Jewish history becomes stateless, powerless for a very long time. And institutions are built in ways that mediate in both cases, whether 
in the way that the temple and the priests mediate between the individual and God, or in the way in which community institutions mediate between a hostile outside and an inside that is home. I always think w w when, when the question of why we need to stop and build institutions, why can't we just run on our own, I think of this moment in the book of Exodus when after the, the book is so dramatic for so long, Exodus is an amazingly dramatic book, there's a baby in a basket and there's, there's, there's plagues and miracles and lightning and thunder and the water is split. And then for like 12 chapters, there's just instructions on how to build furniture. <laughs> it's incredibly dull. And it's precisely how to build a tabernacle so that it can become a place of worship. And in a sense, the book says, all oh, that's great, but stop and build yourself an institution or else you will not be able to really have a relationship with this extraordinary power that we have been witnessing for all this time. And I think that is an important thing to keep in mind, that it is necessary to stop and make sure that we have built some structures for ourselves as human beings to function in the world. And in the absence of them, um, there are no restraints and there are no empowerments. And so there is no, there is no boundary and there is no freedom uh, institutions are enormously important. Yeah, so picking up on some of these themes, um, I'm coming from a Protestant perspective. I was thinking initially of the social realities. I'm thinking likewise, as Rick said, that you can get there theologically. You can get there from a number of other sources as well. Um, I think the sense in which, as Augustine would say, God created one person, and then from that person, every other person so sort of built into our human being. Uh, is interconnection and uh, the socialness is part of what requires the mediating structures um, and the frameworks and the cooperation um, institutions can, can play a role in that. There are certainly versions of Protestantism that um, are less connected to the world and its institutions, or at least think they are. I don't know that they actually are, but um, tend to emphasize um, kind of the spiritual over the material. Um, but I think there are other readings in which you can see kind of a robust vision of creation that involves how we live in the world. And then um, the law in the Hebrew scriptures that speaks widely of a range of realities um, from commerce uh, to agriculture, which were not unrelated at that time, um, uh, the family and worship. Yes, you know, so I think there is this thread um, throughout the scriptures of attending to life in this world and in the institutional frameworks um, that help that. At the same time, we have the categories of, of sin that, that Rick also mentioned um, that are right there in our opening pages as well. So uh, the expectation of things falling short um, is, is right there. And again, drawing on Augustine, the sense in which um, the earthly city is different than the heavenly city and we have different expectations but we can still be united around something like common objects of love in this world, even as we don't have the same hopes and expectations that we might have um, for life in the age to come. So this sense that we're not necessarily surprised um, by the, some of the fallenness we see, and I trust we'll have a chance to talk more about the distrust of institutions, um, which, is, which is something that's a, a mark of modern society, and, and there are real reasons for that, and I think it's, it's worth wrestling, wrestling with, but I'll pause there. So I guess we've covered uh, two religions, so you can probably guess uh, what I am at this point. Um, and if you, uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm Muslim, and I guess maybe some of you thought, well, I could be Hindu or Buddhist or something, but yeah, so um, yeah, uh, so when it comes to this, something that we talk a lot about in, in Islam is the Islamic tradition or the classical Islamic tradition. And the classical Islamic tradition is oriented around an interlocking set of institutions where there is something called institutional memory. So when we think about the Sharia, for example, the institution of um, Islamic law, and Islamic law obviously today has a pejorative um, connotation, but um, if we actually look at the history of it, um, it was this religious scholarly community. They were repositories of God's law. And in this sense, they were very important and very useful in that they provided a check on the sometimes the despotism of the caliph. So you have the executive power, the caliph or the sultan, who doesn't actually do law himself, but executes the law. 
but then you all you have this clerical class that is very important throughout Islamic history that has habits, norms, expectations, predictability. There's a basic sense of what is right and what is wrong, and this is determined by the consensus of the scholars. And the reason we know what the consensus of the scholars is is because this knowledge is passed on from one generation of scholars to the next. And in this sense, um, one way of looking at it is that um, the, um, the scholarly community is the uh, judicial branch to the caliph's executive branch, if you will. And in that sense, there is a kind of balance. We can also talk about the institution of the caliphate. Again, when we think caliphate today, we think, oh, you know, that's kind of it's scary, bad, whatever. But it, if we look historically, the Islamic caliphate was an extremely successful institution. And um, one might even say one of the, the greatest kind of civilizational institutions um, in terms of techno, you know, scientific, philosophical advancement and knowledge. And obviously we've fallen, we as Muslims have fallen from that uh, you know, state of grace, if you will. Um, so those are the two institutions that I would maybe you know, focus on. And, but they are part of this broader thing called the Islamic tradition, which did for uh, the better part of 14 centuries provide uh, great success and, and progress to the body of Muslims, what we call the Ummah. And, um, and at least, you know, as bad as things are for folks in the Middle East and so on, they can at least look back to that institutional memory of the way things were before as a kind of source of inspiration and guidance. That's great, thank you. Um, Kristen, you mentioned trust or distrust a minute ago and it, it called to mind a quote from Yaval's book. I should mention A Time to Build is one of the most important books on institutions in the last many, many decades. So pick up a copy. I've benefited greatly from it. But Yuval, you write that a trusted institution can help us overcome some of the limits of our individual rationality by letting us fall back on a reliable process. And so I take it in that claim, there's some of that notion of constraint. But what I was wondering as I read that was what about, how do you know that the process is reliable? Or what about when it's fundamentally not reliable? And I'm thinking particularly of, of racial and gender dimensions yeah. here. We have in, in recent years, Lots of examples from evangelical culture where the process was, uh, if you're a woman, you, you don't speak up or you're not to be, you're not to disrupt the system and, and fundamental injustices that were justified on the notion of yeah. trust the reliable process of the institution and don't resort to your individual self. So can you talk? Yeah, about I think it's very important to recognize that institutions are not inherently good. And in fact, it, it, maybe in this moment in our society, it's more important to say they're not inherently bad. Um, <laughs> They, the, the idea that something is an institution doesn't tell you very much. Um, you know, a great university like this is an institution, so is the mob. Um, it's not, it, it, the, the fact of its being an institution is not an answer to the question of whether it's good or bad. I think the question of whether we trust it is ultimately a question of whether it does good in our lives. And institutions earn our trust. They earn our trust in a variety of ways uh, by providing us with, with goods we need in ways that we can count on by, again, showing restraint in the use of power. Institutions that don't do that don't earn our trust. We can point to a lot of institutions now that have not earned our trust. I think one thing that's valuable about the density of institutions in American life is that when some fail, there are others we can fall to and call on. And we can even point to the failure of some by pointing to the strengths of others. And I think there are ways in which institutions that have participated in injustice in our society um, can be brought to account by reference to other institutions that we take seriously and value, so that our commitment to equality, our commitment to the rule of law and to our constitution can sometimes act as a way of holding other institutions in our lives, whether those are religious or social or economic, uh, to account. And I think it, it is incumbent on us to hold institutions to account, especially to hold them to account by their own principles. That is, are they living up to what they claim to be? Um, the claim itself is not enough, and they do have to prove themselves. But those institutions that over time we've come to trust in our lives, those institutions that we take seriously as providing us with the kind of support we, needs in those, we need in those moments when we need the most support, uh, do offer us this kind of, of, of shortcut, of way to fall back so that we don't have to do all our own thinking. One of the great things about living in a civilization is that we benefit enormously from things that only other people know. Uh, 
you know, the lights are on in this room. I can't tell you how, I'm sorry. I wish I could. Um, I could probably learn, it would take some time. Somebody knows and they work. And a lot of our life in modern society is like that. We fall back on knowledge possessed by others. And that requires an enormous amount of trust. I mean, we tell ourselves all the time, we don't trust anybody, we don't trust anything. If you think about how you actually live your life, you know, and you get on a bus, uh, you're, you're trusting a lot of people doing a lot of complicated things. And the, the, that takes a lot of successful institutions. And so while I do think, John, we have to be willing to hold institutions to account, to question them, to, 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 to test them, and to make sure they really do what they mean, um, there also are a lot of ways in which institutions allow us to count on integrity rather than counting on our own rationality, to not have to know everything, but to be able to say the fact that this person is in this position actually does tell me something because I trust the institution that he or she is part of. And we all live our lives that way all the time. Yeah, I like the answer, although it does presume that the inconsistencies and the injustices come to light outside of the institution in order to hold it to account. And there are certainly instances where it's that, no easy thing. That those, are, those are the hardest failures, yeah. are failures of institutions that we want to trust, but mm -hmm. turns out we can't. It makes me think too, some of Rick's work uh, around sort of the, almost the jurisdictional autonomy of religious institutions specifically that would say to state actors, you can't come in here because we are outside of the jurisdiction of the government or the state that lends itself to the same kind of concerns or vulnerabilities. So any thoughts from you, Rick, on, on the line between protecting the boundaries or even the jurisdiction of the church while also allowing for intervention when appropriate or needed? I don't know if I have a clear line in mind. I mean, you've kind of anticipated even in your question where I'll probably go, but so I, I do believe, and I've written a fair bit about this, that um, you know, one of the things about institutions is that at least to a point, they get to kind of determine who they are. Um, and they get to decide on mission uh, and generally speaking, get to decide on, on membership and internal rules and so on. And I think adding that basic point to our constitutional tradition of separation of church and state, I do think it's the case that the constitution gives to religious institutions some space, not unlimited space, um, to, uh, to decide for themselves, say, what their creed is going to be. Um, you know, there were times in the past when the emperor could summon all the bishops from around the world and tell them to draw up a creed, and that doesn't happen anymore. And that's, um, in my view, a good thing. That's part of, that's an important dimension of religious freedom. But, as I think we all know, that, that can't be absolute, and there have to be um, uh, opportunities for the state to exercise appropriate authority to you know, prevent institutions from, from harming people. Um, and I think that's, I think that is actually where our law is, generally speaking. I want to contrast institutions to non-institutions, and what would call this question of mine was, my friend Bethany Jenkins recommended a book called New Power, Jeremy Hyman's and Henry Tim's, and this is sort of a focus on online activism, social movements that develop online through network platforms, in contrast to the old power of institutions, and I think one of the things this book sets up nicely is this new power certainly is a form of power and we see the real consequences of that power in many instances and yet it also strikes me that new power often neglects the building of structures and systems that will sustain movements and in some ways I, I do some advising often to students around protests and, and, and spontaneous or momentary protests have the same kind of flavor to them when the, when the hard organizing around the protest doesn't ensure continued and sustained movement. And so I wonder about uh, whether if new power might be more powerful or at least powerful in the short term, but in the long term, the old power of institutions will still matter. And wonder if anyone has thoughts on that contrast between old power and new power and where we are in this current moment of our society. Well, so I think in, you know, um, an underappreciated form of institution is the political party. And I guess most of us probably don't like the political party we're part of, but try to imagine things without it. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, working on, you know, Muslim majority context in the Middle East, I think we can look at how people power was a very powerful idea during the Arab Spring, where you had this um, mass outpouring that was inspirational and there was this moment of euphoria. What did these disproportionately young protesters fail to do? They failed to institutionalize. 
they failed to actually um, create institutions that could channel and coordinate their action. And that's why some might say that uh, one of the reasons these revolutions failed, um, because they weren't able to, to translate in that effective way. Um, well, when I think about the opposite of institutions, you know, in our own context here in America, I think about um, how our institutions were actually surprisingly resilient over the last six years. Like I'm, I'm very bullish about America and American democracy because we saw, in my view, a pretty impressive success. We had a hard test, which was the Trump, uh, the Trump presidency, which was a way of trying to go beyond institutions and norms and to have this kind of arbitrary individual charismatic power and you know that was legitimate and that's what Americans voted for the first time around. But what, what I think was positive is that we saw broader structures that provided an institutional check, even that phrase that we often use, an institutional check on power. That actually, the, whether it was the courts or um, uh, the bureaucracy, you don't want a deep state, don't get me wrong. I don't want to say that you want um, these deeper structures to constrain an elected president too much. But there is, I think, a middle ground where institutions step in, in moments of crisis, and they speak to something beyond the individual leader. And I think that's very important. I would maybe add on this point that I, I think there's a, there's a useful contrast to draw between institutions and networks. Um, and here I really draw on the work of Arnold Kling, an economist at George Mason University who distinguishes between the two in the sense that networks allow people to operate together as kind of equal nodes connected temporarily to achieve a temporary end. They don't assign people roles. They give people uh, a, a kind of ephemeral access to a benefit. And the result of that can be extraordinarily effective. I mean, you think about the internet, there are a lot of networks operating. But because it doesn't involve roles, it doesn't shape the individual in quite the same way. And I think we find in, in the age of the internet and social media, some of the attitudes you're describing about a kind of failure to organize in the wake of protests, I think has to do with the confusion between expression and action that is encouraged by time spent on networks. Networks allow us to express ourselves um, and they encourage us to think that by expressing ourselves, we've done something. And so you've said on Facebook that you're on the side of this team and not that team in this debate or that debate, and you know, given it a thumbs up, you haven't actually done anything about anything. <laughs> um, and it, it leads us to a kind of misimpression of what past examples of institutionalized strength have looked like. So that I think a lot of students today think about the civil rights movement of the middle of the 20th century as a series of protests. But that is not what the civil rights movement was. The civil rights movement was intensely institutionalized and it built up real social power. Protests were just a way of demonstrating that power. Bringing a million people to Washington in the summer of 1963 was a way to say, I can bring a million people to the ballot box in the fall of 1964. <laughs> um, protests now very rarely really send that message. Um, they, they, they happen and then they disappear. They're modes of expression not ways of acting. And I think the reason for that is that they're not institutionalized. The, the line, I think you said earlier today about confusing expression for action was very striking. I've been mulling that over and wonder if it is connected a little bit to the distrust of institutions. Mm -hmm. Hugh Hecklow, who you studied with, you know, talks about um, institutions have really earned our distrust and we do have to acknowledge that. And yet they can still play a good. And so I wonder if there's sort of a coalescing that we have sort of this distrust of institutions, the invisibility at times of institutions, and then this mode of engagement that, that seems like action um, without maybe conceptual categories to say, what, what could we do next? Um, what would the next, the movement from network to institution look like to sustain this movement for the good? Um, and that's where I think resources like yours and others here Excuse me, others here are trying to kind of offer that vision for what institutions can do, but it does take a shift of the imagination because we're more used to attending to where they've fallen short. 
So okay. also appreciate your reminder that they have worked in some significant ways too in recent years. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that if you look at isolated individuals who are disembedded from institutions, like what comes to mind, you know, maybe, you know, people uh, doing TikTok videos on their own, what are they all about? It's about self-actualization. It's very, it's very self-absorbed, it's individualistic, which is fine up to, until a point, but then um, how do you, like, what is beyond that? And, you know, not, I don't want to like, I don't want to go on about the youth or anything here. Uh, I guess I am technically the youngest person on this panel. I don't want to presume anything about my fellow panelists. But, um, you know, I, I do think when, when we're looking at this, um, how expression is, as both of you have said, expression is a substitute for action. And we think by self-actualizing and sharing our story, telling our truth and this sort of, you know, sometimes silliness, we're, we're actually doing something to change the world when we're actually not. We're actually doing something that is self-indulgent and we're, we can, we're sort of imparting upon ourselves a moral superiority if we have the right opinions and the right causes and we put the Ukraine flag on our Instagram profile. But that actually doesn't lead to substantive change. So there's a real danger here in getting these things confused. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I should also note, I, I just, um, I started a TikTok um, account recently and, I, and, I, and I'm trying to learn, but it's very confusing to me. <laughs> Do you have space for me to come in yeah. again? Linking this to identity, um, the theorists that I follow in institutions, you know, suggests that institutions historically had quite a significant role in shaping identity. Now we can see where that fell short and where significant portions were not included in that, but as they were intended to function, providing a sense, you know, whether regionally you were from this place or family or occupation or trade, um, part of the development of, of modern thought was, as I understand it, the idea that you actually are to identify yourself in opposition to institutions. So institutions were at times viewed as a restraint and we are to try to make our mark um, separated from institutions and someone like Peter Berger, a sociologist would say, that's really left us isolated, floating, that there's an identity crisis actually built into this moment because the very things that historically and sociologically are supposed to provide identity we view as a restraint in a problematic way and are trying to free ourselves from. And so we're constantly having to create our identities, curate our identities. And then you, know, you, you combine that with social media, which allows that in ways that none of us could have really anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say things like the rise of both anxiety, tremendous anxiety, as well as political tribalism are connected because we don't necessarily have the sources of identity that robust healthy institutions could provide. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Let's talk about the youth for a minute, Shadi. <laughs> um, I, I read a lot of think pieces critiquing Gen Z, and yet my own experience with my students is one of optimism and capacity and really looking toward the future with, with potentially a, a distrust of institutions as well. And one of the things I'm struck by with my own students the religious students of various stripes seem, seem very committed to their religious particularity, but also very comfortable living in a pluralistic world of, of difference and in some ways are better positioned to do the kind of building that needs to happen as we look ahead. But I, so I wonder about that tension in Gen Z between capacity and optimism, but maybe a, a suspicion of institutions and if any of you have thoughts about the challenges and opportunities. Yeah, one of the things we talked about today in the, in the conference that you put together was um, we, we compared and contrasted thinking about institutions with thinking institutionally about things. Uh, and I, I, for me, that was really helpful. But it strikes me that um, a lot of my students, um, they, they are able to combine, and this, this seems healthy to me, they're able to combine a kind of um, awareness of various institutions shortcomings, um, the need to hold some institutions accountable, the desire to sometimes get a little bit of a critical distance from institutions that might have formed them. And yet, that's thinking about institutions, right? But um, uh, they're still able to think institutionally, that is to appreciate the role that healthy institutions play 
um, not only in the landscape of civil society, like I was talking about earlier with the trees and the prairie and all that, but in, in their own formation. And um, that's good. You know, I, I, I share some of that hope, John. I, I, I find it hard to be hard on young people. I mean, young people are just young people. They're the kinds of things we accuse them of are functions of just not having had a lot of experience in life and not yet having learned the kinds of lessons you only learn the hard way. I, I think the challenges we face now in society are much more the fault of older people than younger people. And they're especially the fault of, of, of the middle and older generations uh, essentially despairing of American life uh, in ways that are not justified and implying to a lot of younger people that the institutions around them have failed, that our society is out of control, that America is on the edge of an abyss. All of this justifies all kinds of bizarre political choices. And I don't think it's justified. I don't think that if you look at this moment in the context of American history, you should be panicked about the condition of our country. We have problems to solve, uh, but we have a lot to work with in solving those problems. And I think that it's up to us to help younger Americans appreciate the resources they're inheriting, even as they surely should, be, should have their eyes open to the challenges that they're inheriting. Um, so, you know, the young have the vices of the young. That's the nature of the world. But I think that at this moment, those of us who should be more mature lack some of the virtues of the more mature. Um, and we should think about what we could be doing differently. To my mind, a lot of that actually is about institutional responsibility and about thinking in terms of the kind of question that someone who takes an institution seriously should be asking, which is something like, given the role that I have here, you know, as a teacher, uh, as, a, uh, 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 as an employer or an employee, as a president of the United States, or as uh, a, 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 a member of this community, what should I be doing? Not just what do I want, not just what would I, how would I like to be seen, but given the role I've got here, what should I be doing? I think a lot of the failures we find in our public life are essentially failures to ask that question. We find ourselves looking at people and thinking, how could he have done that? Doesn't he, doesn't he know what's required of him here? And the answer often is no. And there are ways that asking that kind of question can help our institutions turn us into better people. Even in just the simplest sense of, you know, someone cuts you off on the highway and you're about to tell them what you think of them and you realize there's three kids in the back. And just think, no, I'm a parent. I'm not going to say that right now. That's how we become better people. And I think we've got to allow our institutions to make us into better people in that way in this moment. I wish I were able to do that with my kids in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, yes, and um, I did have some sobering conversations probably three or four years ago with some of our students around ordination. I'm in a seminary context. and. You know, they were simultaneously saying, well, we're very anti-institutional and very suspicious, and we want to be ordained in this denomination, and, and kind of uh, almost like you should ordain us kind of no matter what. <laughs> you know, and it's like, but you're being ordained into an institution that, that has heritage and convictions and procedures, and, you know, so that kind of the, the juxtaposition of that was troubling to me and has made me think a lot about um, how we enliven the imagination around institutions. So I, I see the hopefulness, and I see a lot of space for trying to bring to light um, kind of the windbreaker role or you know, some of the other images. Like I think if we can um, take some of the passion, I very much agree that it's inherited from, from the elders. Um, and the distrust as well like, is legitimate, and I want to acknowledge that. And I want to be able to say there's a way forward that involves a kind of a beautiful picture of, of what we can work on together, acknowledging the messiness and the brokenness too. So I guess I put it in enlivening the imagination is, is where I want to go. Okay, I, I hate to be the buzzkill here, <laughs> but uh, maybe maybe you all are spending time with different young people than I am. I, I mean, look, I want to be careful about what I say because you know I have my students as well, um, and we just had our first class on Tuesday, so I, I don't actually know them all that well for this <laughs> semester. But um, I think there is something, from my perspective, that is distinctive about the Gen Zers that I don't recognize in my own cohort. You know, I came of age, you know, post 9/11, so 9/11, Iraq War, 
those were my formative moments. And um, I don't know, I think there is, this won't be new to a lot of you, but you know, there's a reason that, you know, there was a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, you know, safe spaces, the fact that young people don't seem to have, you know, as much tolerance for adversity or discomfort. Um, they get offended quite easily. Their concept of harm is very expanded to, to anything that kind of unsettles them. And I think that there's a real danger here because part of what college I think should be, and that's part of how I understood it when I was in college, was that um, you know one thing that's really important to learn is to learn how to be offended without freaking out. Mm -hmm. You kind of you know you, you live to fight another day. It's not the end of the world. Um, the idea of microaggressions I find to be absurd. Um, Macroaggressions are the ones that we should be focusing on. So I think that all these things trigger warnings. Um, these were not present. Um, in my generation, and I'm not that old. So something has clearly changed, and we've indulged this kind of behavior, and it has a lot of serious implications. I mean, one basic one is on innovation. Can you really have a population that is innovating on tech, on other things, on political institutions, innovating our political institutions, if they're not actually used to contending with ideas that challenge them? that ideas they disagree with are seen as threats to their very person. This is dangerous in terms of, you know, the hope is that it changes and that over time adversity can be built. But I think the signs that I'm seeing are quite frightening actually. Um, I don't wanna be, you know, I think I'm, I'm bullish on America, but that's in spite of the youth, not because of them. <laughs> okay, so all you Gen Z in the audience, get your questions ready for Shadi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just really quickly. Um, <laughs> this is more of a challenge, I think, facing the folks who've come up, um, you know, in the online era than it is a criticism. But um, time moves really quickly uh, for them. They uh, uh, stuff gets downloaded faster. You know, there's none of that kind of like weird stuff from when I was a kid of trying to like dial up and wait for the thing to buzz. Like this. <laughs> you get the info you need right away. Um, uh, protests can emerge and then disappear very quickly. Um, something can happen on, on Twitter very fast and then go away. And news cycles are quick. Everything's quick. And institutions are, they require some patience. They're sometimes slow. They can be slow to change in ways you like. But even just to kind of do their work, uh, the, their work of formation, it can, it can take some time. And I, I do think that um, it's, it'll, it'll be a challenge, perhaps, for people who, in other contexts of their lives, have been blessed with this incredible tech-driven rapidity to be able to um, cultivate the patience that you need to be able to deal with institutions that, at least in my view, are still essential for their flourishing. I want to ask about institutional leadership. And it seems to me that, in, at least implicit in our assumptions about institutions, is that it often will transcend individual interests. But our model of institutional leadership is often a sort of maximizing of self-interest through ladder climbing. So take the university that we're in, not this one in particular, but the <laughs> university as, a, as an institution where the way you become a college president or a university president is you leave, or we might say abandon one school to go be a dean or a provost at another and then leave that school to go be a, a president somewhere else and then maybe ladder climb again. And if, if we've already talked or, or named this challenge of growing distrust in institutions, if trust depends upon leaders you can believe in who are themselves committed to the institution, but the cultural norm in both higher ed, but also business, corporate America, lots of other institutions is this abandoning, successive abandoning for personal self-interest. How do we reconcile those, those tensions? I don't, I don't know that you can. I think you've really put your finger on something that's a challenge for institutions. I mean, um, at least for some institutions, it strikes me that the, the model we would, should want our leaders to aim for is more of the servant leadership, which is going to involve sacrificial leadership um, and maybe passing on some opportunity uh, in a new place in order to build the one that you're at. But I think you're right. That's not necessarily the model that we have in a lot of contexts today. I think this also points to a deeper challenge for, for trust in institutions which has to do with the way that we've come to see institutions, not as these kinds of formative molds of the people in them, but as platforms for people mm -hmm. to display themselves, to build their own personal brand, 
And a lot of how we think about leadership now in a lot of institutions has to do with the capacity to use the institution to elevate yourself. And the thought is the CEO helps the institution by becoming a public figure, by becoming a celebrity, by becoming a, a big deal. Um, and I, I think a lot of institutions have come to think about leadership that way and to sort of confuse prominence with, with importance in a way that uh, is encouraged by a lot in our culture now. And you find this, for example, you find it a lot in our political institutions. I think a lot of people think about Congress now as a place to build a personal brand, uh, a place to become uh, you know, a, a, a talk radio or a cable news celebrity or become a celebrity on the internet. And in a sense, a way to become an important person individually by channeling frustration with the institution, by acting as an outsider. So you get elected, and then you spend all your time complaining about Congress, which you clearly wanted to go to, because you worked <laughs> so hard to get there. And all you really do is say, you wouldn't believe what people do here. And you want to say, well, you know, you've been there for 25 years, and you're chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Aren't you the people doing it? There? <laughs> but still, everybody wants to approach the public as an outsider, channeling frustration with institutions. I think what it takes to be a leader of an institution is a willingness to be an insider, knowing that often that is not cool and it's not exactly what our culture wants to see, but it's absolutely essential. It has to be a way of, of allowing yourself to be formed and shaped by the institution and acknowledging that the constraints that puts on you are actually liberating, that, that, that cuts off your options in ways that allow you to use the power of the institution most effectively. It's not a model of leadership that we encourage, so I agree with you. I mean, I think the way a lot of institutions, including a lot of universities, think about what it takes to be a leader now encourages a kind of outsider mentality that is not good for them. I, I don't read a lot of business leadership books, but I did read Jim Collins' Good to Great, and I think I'm pulling up accurately that as he profiles businesses that could be considered great, they expected to find that CEOs brought from the outside, kind of the big name hires, would be part of what pushed a company to move into the great category. And it was mo the vast majority of the time internal leaders who are not known, who came in from the inside, um, who had the most significant impact. And I think because of that formative piece mm -hmm. to which you were speaking, that they'd been deeply formed and shaped um, and weren't there for the platform reason. But, you know, there's a tension here because as I'm listening uh, to all of you, and I struggle with this because I, I emphasize in my earlier answer the importance of constraint, but there is such thing as too much constraint. You don't want institutions to be too constraining where they stamp out innovation. And I think that's really important for us to not forget. I mean, we're all pro institutions here, but when an institution becomes so protective of itself that it's afraid of bringing in new voices that challenge the way things are done. Um, and I'm just thinking like, I, I, you know, I wouldn't work in an institution really of any kind because I just don't have, I don't have the right opinions, but that's, that's a problem. You should have room for institution, room in institutions for people who um, are offering a kind of counter narrative. And when institutions don't allow that, they start to get into this stasis of not being able to renew themselves. And I'm sure anyone who's been at a university, again, not this one, of course, God forbid, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, and that's why we complain sometimes about bureaucracies. Bu you know, bureaucracies start to have their own logic that is about self-perpetuation and about prioritizing in the institution above all else. But then you forget, why do we care so much about the institution? What is the end? The institution can't be an end unto itself. It ultimately has to be a means to other things that we hold dear and that we value. And that's where you know, you know, questions around morality and mission and value become really important. You don't want to have institutions that are rudderless in that respect. I've got one more question and then we'll turn to audience questions. We do have some microphones, so wait for the microphone to ask your question. Uh, this one sort of picks up on what Shadi was saying about innovation and what you've always talking about in the insider outsider contrast and I was reminded of uh, <coughs> a conversation that the Danforth Center sponsored several years ago with with Dr. Cornell West and, and Dr. West drew the distinction very helpful to me between reform and revolution that healthy institutions and institutional actors would recognize the difference reformers are trying to work from within and revolutionaries have placed themselves outside of and in some ways against the institution 
And it occurs to me that in many of our current institutions, we are plagued by revolutionaries who think they are reformers or reformers who would be better off as revolutionaries. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on that contrast or distinction or if there are other questions that it raises for you. I mean, I, I think the contrast runs very deep. It is, uh, you know, it, it's present in, in sort of 18th century political thought, this question of reform and revolution. Uh, and I, I think part of what it describes is a, a, a mode of change that begins by rejecting the status quo, a, a revolutionary mode of change, versus a mode of change that begins by accepting the legitimacy of the institutions we have, but faulting them for failing to achieve the, the ends they've set out for themselves. Sometimes, you know, revolution is necessary. There are times when uh, in institutions are so broken that they do need to be overturned. But I think that in a, fu in a functional society, and ours is, um, we have to accept that broadly speaking, most of our institutions are legitimate and effective, but could be doing better. And that attitude is almost the hardest thing to achieve in, in a free society. To say this could be better, rather than on the one hand, this is perfect, don't touch it, or on the other hand, this is a disaster, burn it down. Um, th that middle place is very hard to sustain, and it requires real commitment. It requires a kind of love of the institution that is not easy to achieve. I, I think maybe each of us could point to one or two institutions we're, in we're involved with in our lives about which we have that attitude, an attitude of a kind of love of the institution that makes us capable of reforming it rather than either ignoring its problems or treating it as, as, as entirely broken. And those are the institutions where we ought to spend our time. Maybe that's our workplace, but maybe it's not. Uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's a religious institution. Maybe it's a communal institution. Those are the places that we are ultimately most deeply committed to. And you know, institutions require that kind of commitment. They call for devotion. It's not easy to achieve. Some of the readings we had this, uh, at our conference today uh, when they were discussing, presenting this idea of thinking institutionally, one of the characteristics of that was kind of an attitude of generosity, of, uh, an ability to appreciate that we are inhabiting institutions, we're being formed by institutions that are sort of, that were given to us, that were built by others, that we are the inheritors of, of all kinds of gifts that others worked to build. And there's something about the revolutionary spirit that is, in, to put it mildly, maybe in tension with that attitude of, of, of generosity. One, one can reform while still maintaining that attitude, but the instinct to make all things new strikes me as, as deeply anti-intellectual, uh, anti-institutional. But also we don't need, I mean, presumably, presumably if we've gotten to this point, the institutions that have led us here for all their faults they must have survived for a reason. So I don't like the Electoral College. I wish we had it otherwise, but presumably the Electoral College has survived for a reason. And even if we don't like it, we should interrogate what those reasons are. The fact that um, North Dakota has two Senate seats, which just seems like the craziest thing ever. I would just, I don't know why I went down this rabbit hole. Yeah, I, I love that, uh, by the We way. should talk about the Electoral College. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just found out today that the largest city in Montana is called Billings, and there's only 100,000 people. This is not a real state. But they have two senators. They, they have two senators. OK, so I don't instinctively love that. But there is a reason that the Senate was apportioned in this particular way. There was a wisdom to it. And we may have to dig deeper to find that wisdom and we can always do reforms. But when people say, well, let's just kind of scrap all of this, then they're losing sight of how we came to where we are today. And this I think you know, fits into a broader conversation about how we feel about our own country. If you think America is bad and evil, then you're gonna be more likely to think in this revolutionary way of burning it down. Um, I don't think that's the right way to think about America, and this could be my own like immigrant bias, but you know, uh, my family saw what the alternative is. If you have an experience in actual authoritarian settings, it does give you a deep appreciation for America, which is one of the reasons I think like brown immigrants are the future because we're like we love America, you know, <laughs> where I feel like a lot of my white liberal friends when they hear me use the word love as it relates to America, they're like, we've never what what are you saying? You mm -hmm. love America? How can you know, anyway, don't, don't get me, yeah. Um, 
But I'll just say, well, maybe one more thing. But you don't that, love North Dakota, apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Montana. North Dakota. <laughs> but just like one more thing on, like, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a serious note, I guess all of this is serious, mm -hmm. but um, I think that, you know, um, you, especially young people have to make a decision of whether or not they want to work within the system or outside of the system. And I contended with some of these questions post 9-11. I was very involved in the anti anti-war movement, you know, with the Iraq war specifically. And we used to organize things on ca campus that are not particularly institutional, like die-ins. I don't know if folks know what a die-in is, but you get basically like 40 or 50 people and they lie on the ground as if they're dead. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of use that as a way to, um, you know, bring attention to a particular cause. In this case, it was uh, about the Iraq war. But at some point I made, I made a decision that as frustrating as it might be, the, the way to actually affect change is to have at least some eye towards institutions and to work within them, maybe not entirely, but at least to some extent, especially in a country like America that has deeply embedded institutions, right? And I think that, you know, religion can help in the futility aspect because if you feel like everything is in the here and now, that life is now because this is all there is, you're going to be extremely impatient. And because um, this, you know, this is literally all you have. But with religion, at least um, the religions that we're part of, life is elsewhere in some very basic sense that there is a next life and you can kind of postpone your hopes. You don't need everything to be resolved now. And this is why I think religion is anti-utopian in this way, at least currently, because it, it acknowledges that utopia is not possible now. Because you know, um, not to get Calvinist or anything, but there is sin, the, the reality of sin, the fact that we're broken by it and so on and so forth. Mm. Muslims don't have the same vision of that, but I think that's, that's a useful way of looking at things. And it allows us to readjust our hopes and expectations and to say, basically, you know, we'll try our best, but there's, um, there's a prophetic hadith in, in Islam that, you know, you have camels, at least you used to have cam camels um, in Arabia in the desert. Um, and um, you tie your camel to the tree and then you leave it because you've done the best you can. You don't know what's gonna happen afterwards. Maybe someone else will come and cut the cord or someone will attack the camel and you'll come back and you won't find it. But the best you can do is the best you can do. You tie your camel, you leave it, the rest is up to God. Mm -hmm. Questions do you all have? Thank you. I appreciate it. So something you talked about um, is how an institution can be effective in terms of making long term change as opposed to a short term change like protests or social media posts. My question is, um, how can a institution be effective if it lacks uh, money? Um, and I ask about this because um, something Gen Z lacks is uh, as much income as the older groups have. And I'm wondering how can the younger generation that lacks financial means make a difference um, without having the finance to support um, institutions in the same way? Thank you. Well, I, I, I think in part, this is what I mean by saying the young just have the vices of the young. Um, and uh, Gen Z is not shaping up to have less money than prior generations did at your age. Um, and I, from everything we can see at the moment, you're likely to be wealthier than prior generations when you reach their ages. But it is certainly true that at a young age, uh, political activism and other forms of action uh, don't have the kinds of resources that older people do. I think that can be one reason to become part of existing institutions that do have the resources to help you channel your desire to make the world a better place in more constructive ways. It's also a reason to try to build institutions and build up their resources. Um, but there's no denying that money makes a difference and that, that being established makes a difference. And that certainly is one way in which you know, younger people are always disadvantaged in a society where citizen action is how change happens. Um, but they also tend to have more energy, tend to have uh, more time for being active. Um, and, you know, give it time, you'll get there. Down here in the front. 
um, I um, appreciate all the face of uh, the, the three of the three or four of you all have a common book, uh, whether it was from Abraham or the Old Testament or the New Testament. Uh, and, and this is the foundation for my question. Um, so most of humanity for two, 3,000 years, we, we've been evolving and we have a, we have a historical memory. Um, hum, humanity, that's our past, but looking forward, uh, I also see, you know, Buddha and Na Native American religions, they don't, they don't poo-poo in their nest. And, and what I'm seeing is, in our institutions is uh, looking at the Napoleonic War, World War I, with uh, President uh, Wilson, the League of Nations. And then when we went to World War II, uh, the war, you know, the war is to end war and the greatest generation. And, and, and now we're, uh, I never would have imagined in my lifetime to see another Hitler so, so I, my religion and your religion gives us hope and the cup is half full. But one of my favorite movies is uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So, so the people in the insane asylum are, are smarter and more sane than the people outside. Uh, what Putin has recreated in Ukraine, I never would have believed. And, and President Trump thought about dropping a nuclear bomb on North Korea. Uh, we've got uh, artificial intelligence running uh, perpetual submarines that, that have a, a, a fusion bomb on them. Russia created the Tsar bomb. And, and I, I'm, I have an engineering background. If you, if you look at the insanity, we have all these institutions, but then our, our human uh, negative spirit, uh, how, how can we prevent the, the nuclear midnight clock from wiping us all out so so can you comment on institutions uh, giving humanity a future uh, i'm not seeing it in in the technological world without religion <laughs> well, all, all religions wait sorry what do you mean without without religion like without religion okay no, no, I'm saying there's a reason for religion. It's, it's a foundation stone. It, it's making us human as opposed to inhuman Hitler, inhuman Saddam Hussein, inhuman Putin. Okay. Well, there's a lot there. I do think one of the things that has came up in our discussions today and has come up in our session now is that institutions, you talked about the future and threats to us of various kinds. And I, I, I do think, um, again, going back to my maybe kind of hokey image of, um, of the windbreaks on the prairie, that, that institutions provide us with kind of a, um, maybe this a scaffolding is the right word, but they kind of, they kind of strengthen um, society, which is facing lots of challenges. You, you mentioned many of them, but uh, healthy institutions, and I would say uh, in particular, uh, faith-based institutions, um, can help to alleviate and to respond to uh, some of the concerns and threats that you raised, I believe. Even unhealthy ones. I spent four years at the Pentagon, not your classic healthy institution, 20,000 people being bureaucrats, and yet the Pentagon does its job that prevents the nukes from flying. And the Pentagon after 9-11 coordinated a response that, you know, while certainly problematic, could have been a lot worse without the Pentagon. And so I think there are are ways in which our existing institutions do constrain and provide these checks in important ways. Someone in the back had a question? Thank you. I wanted to focus on a lot of talk of trust and integrity in institutions and the two that we have here, religion and politics. Ever since, for me, when we started to hear about alternative facts and then the idea that now people just, it's no longer alternative facts, it's just a willingness to just outright lie. And that the institutions then, it, at worst, are embracing it, and, you know, 
at best they're not they're negligent and not negating it and then one institution will follow another institution and say well this institution is giving me what I want whether it be a Supreme Court judge so on my question is are the institutions changing the people or the people changing the institutions because it doesn't seem to be working right now So I, I think part of the part of the problem here is that we judge institutions by their outcomes. If we like the outcomes that the institutions produce, we're like great, great institutions. But if then they later on produce a different result, and this kind of consequentialist outcomes-oriented approach, I think, is increasingly characteristic of American political debate. Just see how people shift on the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court issues liberal rulings, oh, then the Supreme Court is the bulwark of American democracy. But if it, if it issues a ruling like, like Dobbs, then, oh, the Supreme Court is a threat to democracy as we know it. It's not based on any procedural consistency. It's purely based on the outcome. And at some basic level, people have to be committed to process rather than what the process produces. You see similar things that you know, um, the Senate was great when it produced 60 Democratic senators. And then when Democrats started doing less well in elections, then you heard this narrative that the Senate is disproportionately biased against a Democratic Party. Well, you know, if it shifted this quickly, what's going on here? So people are shifting their positions very quickly, and they're not even offering a pretense of consistency in principle. So I think at a very, you know, at an individual level, each and every one of us has to think, I think more clearly about what are the principles that we hold to and we try to hold to them, even if they produce outcomes that we hate, which I think is also a way to approach democracy. Democracy is good even if Donald Trump wins in 2024. If he wins fair and square, then we have to respect that outcome, whether we like it or not. That doesn't mean democracy is bad. It doesn't mean we suspend our appreciation of democracy because it's the process and the procedure that is integral here. Another part of the question that I heard was sort of the challenge of whether we are forming institutions or institutions are forming us. And you've all had a lot about that in our earlier discussion today. Uh, I'm, I'm struck, I'm, I'm thinking of the philosopher Alistair McIntyre who talks about how we are shaped by the practices and habits that we inculcate within institutions and, and those could be for good or for bad and, and, and often for bad. And so any thoughts on how, I mean, we know these institutions are imperfect, but when, when they get to a point of being unhealthy to the point of them shaping us yeah. to be malformed human beings, how do, we, how do we know and what do we do? I think there's no question that our institutions shape us and we shape our institutions. They are, they are us, right? They're, they're conglomerations of people but they, they inculcate habits in us that end up shaping our character. And so there's certainly a way that the American constitutional system shapes the character of the American people. There's a, there's a practical way that that happens. The institutions create majorities, right? There's not just a free floating majority out there that wants something and then on election day, we ask people what it is and there's the answer. The majority is actually a function of the question we put to people so that in the United States, the question is who should be president? That's not exactly what we ask in other democracies. We ask, which party are you of, or which party do you support uh, in, in parliament? A different question will result in a different answer. A different, uh, the experience of, of being governed by different kinds of institutions over time changes the character of the people. There's no way around that. And I think that when our governing institutions fail, they, do, they can deform us, just as they can form us in constructive ways when they're working. I think it's worth our while to see where they succeed as well as where they fail. Our institutions are built to create frustration. They are intentionally designed to work slowly uh, and, to, and to confront a lot of veto points. It's very hard to get anything done and that's on purpose so that we don't do stupid things too often. Um, and I think we should value that and we should see that in moments of crisis, our system actually can work pretty well. A very divided Congress in a very divided Washington reacted with enormous energy to, for example, the COVID pandemic. The United States public policy reaction to that was easily the best in the world. Uh, it, it averted an economic catastrophe that other countries did not avert nearly as well. 
Um, and, you know, it suffered from all the faults that our kind of politics suffers from. It was kind of crude, it was messy, uh, it, 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 was, it was theoretically inexplicable, but as a practical matter, it worked pretty well. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I think that our, our kind of system has certain strengths, it certainly has certain weaknesses. We live in a time when the incentives drive, I think, the wrong kind of person into politics. And we've got to think about how to change the system by changing those incentives, by encouraging people to enter the system who want to participate in it, who want to be part of a process of negotiating toward a compromise solution. Right now, our politics does not invite people of that sort into the system. And we end up with people who are very unhappy with the system in which they're playing a part. And that shapes us too. But I think our system gives us a lot to work with. I'm a, 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 I, 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 I love the American system of government. I think for all its faults, we're very, very lucky to have it and should work on making it a better version of itself. Assuming all institutions for all time have always been some combination of trustworthy and non-trustworthy and it's not binary, uh, do you think that the institutions have actually become less trustworthy? And if not, what's been the, the, the variables in society that have shifted that opinion? I, I, um, I wonder if they've become less trustworthy or just for all kinds of reasons, we know more about mm -hmm. them than if we'd known before, <laughs> it might've been different. I mean, certainly information flow has to be, has to be part of it too. Um, uh, but I do, I think the, Yuval's onto something when he, when he raises the points about the incentives that various institutions set up for people to come into them. And it, I'm thinking out loud here, but it, uh, if, a, if the incentives to go into an institution are such that they don't kind of function to bring in people who are gonna be the kind of folks we can trust, then institutions might struggle to be trustworthy, right? Kind of an obvious point, I suppose, but. Um, I suspect it's always been a mix, as you pointed out, but we know more. We know more now than we did. Yes, I, the knowledge question came to mind first. I, I was thinking earlier today about time I spent at a, um, it's an institution in our town that provides a place for retirees to gather. And I was speaking with them about institutions and they had overall a much more positive sense of institutions than my typical younger audience. But then we kind of went through decade by decade, you know, I don't know if some of you remember the quiz show scandals where when TV was first invented and we trusted what came through and then we realized, oh, these quiz shows are rigged to kind of keep more of an audience. And, and then there's Watergate and then, you know, you can just, and then tobacco and then, you know, there's just almost no institution as a realm that's been unscathed in recent decades, you know, from entertainment to politics to business, et cetera, um, to, you know, we talked about religious institutions as well. So it's sobering. I mean, and, and we've lived through there. I think there was a hope at a certain point that we could trust certain institutions. That was probably a bit naive, which is where some of the theological categories can be helpful. Um, but I think they have always been, there's always been corruption. Mm -hmm. I think there's a thing about late modern societies where there's just a kind of built-in negativity bias. And you'll find that, you know, a lot of people you meet and talk to in, in Western democracies, not just in the US, either they think the past was better than the present or they believe the future is better than the present. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who think the present is pretty good tends to be a minority. And, par and part of this is because of, as, as several of you have said, um, with rapid educational attainment over the past century, with more knowledge, more access to information, people's expectations increase exponentially as well. And so they're more likely to be disappointed. And so when we look at the polls about how decline in trust in institutions, yes, we should take that seriously, but we should also be careful not to read too much into it because we see these, this declining trust across all Western democracies. It can't be possible that all of these institutions suck simultaneously, <laughs> right? So clearly something else is going on here that colors how people respond to pollsters in this sense. And you know, um, I know there's actually um, a, a, a political philosopher, I don't wanna say too much about the argument who's working on a, on a book on the case for ignorance, but, um, but you know, ignorance is underrated. Mm. <laughs> um, and sometimes it's better not to know. 
We are about to wrap. I want to remind folks that we have a reception coming up right after this discussion. I'm going to give uh, you all one final comment, and I want, to, I want to suggest that you offer one piece of practical advice for the sake of future institution building. And so we can end on an optimistic note. I'm going to start with Shadi and come this way. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, let me see. Um, well, I think you know, just on a, on a sort of like somewhat um, like kind of lame positive note, I would just say that um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, at, at the end of the day, each of you has agency over your own life, at least to some extent, or at least um, you have more agency over your own life than that of others. And I think that you know, reflect on what we've talked about, but then think about which institutions are important to you which ones you maybe want to be more embedded in. Perhaps you want to find an institution to join. Maybe you feel for whatever reason that you're sort of in this state of enemy where you're, um, you're just sort of an individual who's isolated from you know, deeper social relationships. And just think more consciously about the role that institutions play in your own life. And if you find what we've said about the positive aspects of institutions compelling, then um, you know perhaps this can serve uh, as an inspiration. My mind went to history, that uh, there's a lot to learn from looking back, not in a rose-colored glasses way, but we tend to be ahistorical. A um, and even you know something like the civil rights movement, which which we've mentioned, and you can go back further. I mean, if you're animated by the idea of change and you're wondering what does that mean institutionally? Um, can you look back and see how other movements have actually taken shape and what some of the infrastructure was and can that be part of, kind of enlivening your imagination um, for what you might participate in? And, and can you imagine then what you might join perhaps even more than what you might start? Um, what change might look like that way. I would say I, I, I think it's worth your while to think about institutional engagement not as a burden, but as an opportunity, as an answer to the question you ask yourself in the moments when you're most worried about the future. And that question very often has to do with the sense that things are out of control, that you have no part to play. And in fact, there, for all of us, there is some set of institutions where we have a role, um, where we play some part or could. Um, ask yourself where that is. Where, what's the set of institutions you really want to be identified with? And really find ways to devote yourself to their, to their betterment. Um, there are ways to do that. They don't have to be huge. You don't have to give up your life and, uh, and, and, and make everything about those. But find ways to draw happiness and draw meaning out of an institution whose fate you feel like is tied up with yours. Mm -hmm and make it better in small ways. And just ask yourself, given the role that I've got there, what should I be doing in life? It's a question we can all ask. It's, a, it's an answer we can all give. And those small commitments really matter. They matter to the institutions, but they also matter in making your everyday life more enjoyable. And so I think look to it as an opportunity, not, uh, not as some heavy obligation that uh, feels like homework. Um. I think I've said a couple times already that uh, one of the one aspect of thinking institutionally is to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. I didn't, I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it did. <laughs> um, so um, I just thought of this, but make a list of uh, five ways in which uh, you've benefited or been blessed by an institution that someone else built. Do like an inventory of your life. Identify five. And just be grateful for that. And then the second thing, if um, this is not a line, but this is religious perspectives. I don't, you know, we, we pray for our friends, we pray for our loved ones. I think it's appropriate to pray for the institutions that you care about, to pray for their well being, to pray for their stewardship, to pray for their leaders. Um, they need it, like we all do. So that's what I do. Would you join me in thanking our panelists tonight? Attitude of gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> the rest.